Good morning all. So today is the topic of discussion is hepatopathology of flevi viruses. So uh, flevi viruses are basically the group of the viruses which requires the uh, help of the orthopods for their transmission. And this group of the viruses includes Japanese encephalitis, West Nile fever, dengue, Zika, yellow fever, and tick-borne tick viral encephalitis. The various vectors which they require for their transmission are dengue, as are mosquito for Japanese encephalitis, uh, and uh, dengue, Zika, and yellow fever. For the ticks, as an orthopod, the viruses which need ticks for their transmission are tick-borne flevi viruses. Now, this group of the viruses differs in the epidemiology depending upon the prevalence, occurrence of the orthopods in the different geographical area, as well as the seasonal variation and the various anti-vectoral measures of that particular area. If we talk about the epidemiology, we know dengue, our country is hyperendemic uh, for dengue with prevalence in various Southeast Asian regions. Yellow fever, which is basically confined to African and South American countries. Japanese encephalitis in the eastern part of our country, along with the Southeastern Asian countries. And tick-borne and flavi viruses, which are confined only to the European countries of, countries of the world. Now, if we talk about the genome, the genome of these flavi viruses are approximately 11 kilobase. These are the single-stranded positive sense RNA. And they have a prime, prime of the viruses and inducing an immune response. And non-structural proteins includes various non-structural antigens ranging from NS1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. These non-structural antigens are basically responsible for the replication process of these flavi viruses. Now, this is the structure of the mature flavi viruses, particles which are released. So they are, uh, um, these are the uh, structural envelope uh, RNAs which are on the surfaces, we have the structural proteins, a membrane M and E protein. And inside it, there is a nucleocapsid, which includes the RNA and various non-structural uh, proteins. And this is the one which is surrounded by the lipid membrane, which are derived from the host. Now, how do these viruses repl uh, replicate in our body? Once uh, the uh, virus enters into our body, it has to enter the cells. There is a receptor-based entry of the cell into the human host. And what are the exact receptors? It is still not known. Once the, uh, there is attachment, the attachment basically helps with the E protein, which is present on the virus, and the various receptors on the host. Once the attachment is there, once the attachment is there, there is an endocytosis of this virus. There is a once there is a uh, fusion of phagosomes and the lysosomes, resulting in the release of the membrane of the uh, virus, resulting in the release of the single-stranded RNA. This RNA enters into the cytoplasm and undergoes further replication. This a positive strand RNA results in the formation of various polyproteins, which are further degraded into non-structural proteins, or the single uh, or the single-stranded RNA may further undergo the forms a replication process. That is, single-stranded RNA convert, positive-stranded RNA converted into negative sense, and negative sense further converted into the positive sense. Now, the peculiarity of these flevi viruses are, when this kinds of the replication is going on, they induce some kind of membrane changes in the endoplasmic reticulum for their own benefit. There is a formation of replication organelles that is, uh, the RNA which has been formed is stored in these replication organelles. And the virus also needs the help of the lipid droplets. So the lipid droplets uh, from the body will, uh, capsid and antigen of the virus will attach to it. The capsid antigen along with the lipid molecules will enter it becomes close to the endoplasmic reticulum and further replication of the virus or the release of the baryon takes place. So here in the replication cycle, the virus too requires uh, lipids for their proliferation. And there is a further release of the mature baryons from the cells. Now, what are these flavi viruses has an impact on the liver? Majority of the studies to understand the pathogenesis has been conducted on animal models and they have proposed various 
methods or process by which they can infect our liver. So what happens when we, uh, the mosquito bite to us, the virus enters, dendritic cells take us into action, the virus moves toward the lymphoids, and from the lymphoid it enters into the blood circulation. When it enters the blood, it enters into the different organs of the body, one of which is also our liver. So what happens in the liver? The damage to the liver can be direct cytopathic effect of the virus, or it can be immune mediated. So in the liver, what happens is once we have the virus, our CD4 T cells get activated. There is a release of interferon gamma, release of interferon at cytokines like interleukin-1, 6, and TNF-alpha. So what happens is the uh, effect of these cytokines along with the production of nitric oxide will affect the membrane permeability of endothelial cells resulting in the release of the fluid without any proteins in the blood cells. And that is the reason we see there is a hepatocyte and edema, bleeding edema, inflammatory infiltrates, or hepatocyte swellings. Apart from that, what happens is because of the TNF-alpha, TNF-alpha has got a various dangerous effects on the mitochondria. There are the certain changes which occurs in the mitochondrial membrane because of which there is a release of various cytokines in and leading to the activation of apoptosis. Apart from that, there is a decrease in the oxidative phosphorylation. So there is a decrease in the production of ATP, which in turn leads to the increased glycolytic ATP. Another factor, another way they can affect our liver is the TNF-alpha negatively correlates insulin receptor substrate. As a result of which, there will be the increased insulin resistance there will be increased glucose consumption because of which the pathways of gluconeogenesis and lipogenesis get activated. And this is the reason why, because of the increase in the lipogenesis, in the liver we found is the steatosis, a pathological finding, along with the elevation of ALT and AST. So what are the pathological changes in the liver? So this is a normal hepatocytes, and the blood flows from the hepatic, uh, from this, hepatic artery portal vein towards the central vein. Whenever the virus affects our liver, so there are the certain pathological changes which happens. We know the liver is divided into different zones. The ones, area one, which is near to the central vein, are the area which is having a very abundant blood supply. Area two, which is a mid-zone area, and area one, which is towards the periportal tract. So area, zone one and zone two are the regions which has a less blood supply and oxygen supply. And that is the reason these two are the areas where the maximum chances of hepoptosis or necrosis happens. Apart from that, we can see there is a presence of virus antigen in the cuffer cells, leading to the cuffer cell hyperplasia. We can also have uh, uh, the detection of these viruses, antigens, in the cuffer cells, in the hepatocytes. So these are certain morphological changes in the liver. So coming to each process, that is a steatosis, as already explained. Uh, for, uh, for their replication, the viruses requires the lipids. So these viruses modulate the process of lipogenesis. And because they require, there is an accumulation, active accumulation of the lipids. As there is an accumulation of the lipids, there is a rampant replication of the virus in the hepatocytes, leading to the formation of steatosis. When we compare the pathological difference between the yellow fever and the dengue fever, we found that there is a moderate steatosis in the zone 2 area, which has an impaired oxygen and the blood supply, compared to zone 1 and zone 3. However, in the chikungunya, though belonging to the toga viride, I just want to uh, compare it because they are again transmitted by the same vector. What they found is there is again the same mechanism which is happening in the chikungunya as well. Now, this steatosis can be microvascular steatosis or macro, depending upon the uh, uh, size of the lipid droplets which is found in the hepatocytes. The another process is a necrosis. Now, this necrosis can be IRD directly because of the cytopathic of the virus. There is an increased number of the viruses in the hepatocytes. There is a changes in the membrane structure of the mitochondria. There is a release of various uh, lysosomes, and uh, which in turn in enhancing the process of destruction. Apart from that, this can also be through the immune mediated. Whenever the virus is there, the antibody formation will be there, which in turn leads to the activation of various 
T cells resulting in the release of various cytokines resulting in the process of necrosis. Apoptosis, again, this is again the most significant factor leading to the liver injury is the apoptosis. Now, this apoptosis pathway can be both mitochondrial dependent, that is the intrinsic pathway, or it can be based on the death receptor, that is the extrinsic pathway. So, what happens in the mitochondria is, the mitochondrial always maintains its membrane permeability or integrity with the help of BSL-2 and BSL-XL. However, because of the increased stress, reactive oxygen species, and uh, this endoplasmic reticulum undergoes certain changes. There is an activation of BACS M and BACS cell, which in turn enhances the caspases, act activation of the caspases, resulting in the apoptosis. In the extrinsic pathway that is uh, dead dependent, there is an expression of FAS and FAS, uh, there is interaction between the FAS and the FAS legion, which in turn again uh, result, uh, leads to the activation of the caspases and enhancing the apoptosis. So apoptosis process seen both in the yellow fever and the dengue fever, but not in chikungunya. So this is a study where they have tried to look upon the pathological changes caused by the dengue fever. So they have taken the liver biopsy of the post-mortem cases and all these cases were infected with dengue 3 serotype. They were able to demonstrate the pathological changes in the liver tissue. There is a uh, hemorrhage, there is a edema, there is a presence of both macro, uh, uh, macrostetosis or microstetosis. Apart from that, they were also able to demonstrate the dengue 3 antigens in the endothelial cells, in the kuffer cells, and in the hepatocytes also. Just the demonstration of dengue antigens does not serve the purpose because these antigens can also be seen in the phagocytose kuffer cells. So what they said is the replication of the virus in the liver is a better marker to prove that yes, this virus is, is actively multiplying in our hepatocytes. So they try to demonstrate the presence of NS3 because this uh, NS3 non-structural antigen will be expressed only in the cases when the virus is actively undergoing multiplication. So this study have shown that apart from the liver, the dengue antigens were demonstrated in the heart, in the lung, in the kidney, and in the spleen. However, the active replication of the dengue virus could not be established in kidney. So now, uh, what, what are these viruses has an impact on the liver? As I told, these are divided into yellow fever, dengue fever, tick-borne, Zika, and the Japanese encephalitis. What the studies have shown is the dengue fever and the yellow fever are the ones which are most hepatotropic. Unlike the Japanese encephalitis and Zika virus and tick-borne, where, um, where they are more associated with encephalitis. Now, if we talk about the liver function test in the terms of hepatic damage as evident by the measurement of ALT, excretory function as measured by bilirubin or synthetic function by the measurement of prothrombin and metabolic function by ammonia, what we saw is the cases infected with dengue fever, all the cases infected with the dengue fever will have a markedly hepatocyte damage as evident by the increase in the ALT levels. They will also have a markedly increased bilirubin level. However, the subset of the population will end up into a, such a severe toxic phase where the hepatic damage will be so markedly that the ALT can raise up to more than 20 times the upper limit with a hyperbilirubinemia, cogalopathy, and multiple organ dysfunction. Unlike in dengue, yes, majority of the patients infected with dengue will have altered ALT levels indicating the hepatocyte damage which is happening in the body. However, Many of the studies shows that bilirubin, PT, and ammonia levels remains unaffected. But among the patients infected with the dengue, less than 5% of the patients will again enter into the toxic phase where with their markedly deranged hepatocyte dysfunction as evident by more than 10 times the upper limit of ALT derangement, coagulopathy, as well as multi-organ dysfunction seen. If we talk about tick-borne flaviviruses, yes, 70 to 80 percent of the patients might have elevated ALT levels, but the elevated ALT levels were not were up to five times the limit only, and they were not clinically associated with the significant hepatocyte damage in the studies. 
And if we talk about the Zika and Japanese encephalitis, yes, a very, very less percentage of the population will have the deranged ALT levels, which is again very insignificant. So, if we talk about the viruses which have among the flaviviruses groups which have a proven hepatotropism, is only the dengue and the yellow fever. Now, coming based on the epidemiology of our country, what holds important to us is dengue. So dengue, yes, we all know this is considered one of the global threat, affecting more than 100 countries in both the tropical and subtropical countries. Our country, which is hyperendemic for in, in, uh, dengue, based on the E antigens, these dengue viruses has been divided into four different serotypes, one, two, three, and four. Our country is hyperendemic, where all the four serotypes are be continuously circulating, one, one serotype might be a particular prevalent in a particular area, but yes, all the four serotypes can be seen in our country. Now, this is the National Vector Borne Disease Control Program data where they are uh, updating all the cases of dengue viruses in our country on a timely basis. And seen in Delhi, yes, uh, Delhi is considered again a very hyperendemic city of our city. And the, we have also seen the various epidemics and the outbreaks and the circulation of various serotypes in our city as well. So uh, ICTAM has continuously been publishing the various circulating uh, uh, genotypes, serotypes in our country, and we have also shown the prevalence, predominance of one or a particular serotype with a time, which varies with time. Recently, uh, into 2023, what we have seen is an unpublished data. All the dengue viruses belongs to serotype 2. So these viruses, based on the uh, variation in the E proteins, are divided into two serotypes. And they can also be divided into different genotypes based on the differences in the genome. If the genome differences is more than 6%, they are divided into various genotypes. Dengue 1 into different genotypes, 2, 3, and 4. And as I told you, Dengue 2 is the most prevalent right now in our country, with the cosmopolitan as the most prevalent genotype. Now, what is a transmission cycle? Yes, we all know the dengue virus. There is a sylvatic cycle as well as there is an urban cycle. Sylvatic cycle is the one which keeps on going in the very dense forest area where the cycle was maintained only between the primates and the mosquitoes. But what happens with the urbanization, with the deforestations, the humans get exposed to these areas where they got bite with the infected mosquito and later on the urban cycle, that is the cycle between human and the mosquito, got established. When we, uh, when the, what is the intrinsic period and the extrinsic, when the virus enters into our, uh, first, the virus enters into our body, they bite uh, the human blood. Now, if the human is infected with the dengue viruses, the virus will get transmitted to the mosquito as well. From the mosquito, the virus is first in the salivary glands. The virus again has to move in the midgut of the mosquito for its replication. From midgut, the virus again has to go into the salivary gland. So this cycle is known as intrinsic cycle, which happens in the mosquito. That is replication of the virus in the mosquito. And this intrinsic cycle ranges around 10 days. Now, once the mosquito is having a virus in its salivary gland, they will bite to a human. Now, with the human bite, with the, sorry, with the mosquito bite, the virus will enter to us, and that's how the uh, cycle is, keeps on going. Now, once the virus enters into the body and the patient start producing symptoms, so that period is known as the extrinsic incubation period, which again ranges from 5 to 10 days. WHO has given the classification. Earlier, the dengue was classified under classical dengue fever, and uh, DHF and dengue shock syndrome. But in 2009, the WHO has modified its definition and has classified dengue as the dengue with the, without any warning sign or the dengue with warning sign, along with severe dengue when there is an evidence of either plasma leakage, severe hemorrhage, or any of the organ involvement. Now, what's the pathogenesis of the dengue? Again, it's very complicated. It's very multifactorial. Again, the uh, pathogenesis can be direct cytopathic or it can be the immune mediated. So there are the various possible theories for the dengue viruses which has emerged. Uh, so most important among them which we should know are the two things, original antigenic sin and second is antibody dependent enhancement. 
what actually is or original antigenic sink is once the patient get infected with a particular serotype for example if the patient is infected with serotype 1 our, our t cell systems get activated they results in the formation of uh, t cells activated t cells which are specific only to serotype 1 So they will help in containment of the infection and now they will be pool of the memory cells they will be pool of the memory cells which has the activity against specifically to serotype 1 only now if the patient get reinfected with the serotype 1 again so what will happen these memory t cells will get activated and they will take care of the infection and the patient does not have a severe infection when they are reinfected with the same serotype but what happens if they infected with a different serotype so the specific t uh, like uh, t cell specific serotype one specific t cells are there but they will not be able to take care of the virus because the specificity for these t cells are for serotype one only and not for two as a result of which the replication of the virus cannot be controlled and in turn leads to the serious complication of the dengue manifestations apart from that the dengue virus itself can lead to the direct uh, injury to the endothelium the various cytokines which are released can also leads to the mast cells degranulation which in turn further releases the cytokine leading to the huge cytokine storm happening in inside the body of the human in humans another important aspect is antibody dependent enhancement so what happens is if the patient is um, infected with a particular serotype our antibodies will be formed against that particular serotype and these antibodies are the ones which are neutralizing antibodies so if the patient again get infected with the same serotype these neutralizing antibodies will come into action they will attack the virus and hence our um, infection get limited but what happens if the patient get infected with a different serotype those antibodies which are formed in the previous infection they will come into action but they they will bind to the virus but they will not able to neutralize it that means the virus is still there so this complex that this virus along with the antibody will be further intake will further be taken up by the dendritic cells to fc receptors there will the rampant replication of the virus resulting in the excessive secretion of the various cytokines and leading to the mass destruction apart from that this virus complex that is the virus along with non neutralizing antibodies can also bind to the mast cells resulting in the release of the various cytokines and further complications now what is the mechanism of liver injury in the dengue as said the liver injury in the dengue can be both direct cytopathic effect or it can be immune mediated effects on the liver so what happens the virus enters the virus can be demonstrated even in the endothelial cells in the hepatocytes as well as in the kaffir cells so what happens is the dengue ns1 antigen itself can causes direct injury to the endothelium or our body will produce antibodies against the ns1 antigen so the um, uh, uh, the there are the certain antigens which mimics to that of ns1 so the antibody will rather than binding to the ns1 they will bind to the self antigens which are present in the plasmin or the endothelium which in turn leads to the activation of nitric oxide and further destruction of our endothelium leading to the plasma leakage thrombocytopenia uh, virus seen in the kaffir cells again they they will be the activation of the immune response resulting in the lots of release of the cytokines and further injury to the liver now what happens in the liver yes when the virus enters into the liver and if kappa beta get activated there is a release of the interferon gamma now this interferon gamma basically has an antiviral properties they will try to contain the infection but however when the uh, when the virus load is very high with a very uh, with a very pathogenic strain this immune response is unable to control the virus replication there is a certain release of interleukin 6 8 10 and the 12 which in turn leads to the activation of various t cells natural killer cells cd4 t cells and the cd8 t cells now once these activated natural killer t cells are there they can activate the trail and causing the apoptosis apart from that 
the activated CTA T cells, they will recognize the antigen which is present in the hepatocytes. They will start producing fast lesion and which will get attached to the FAS which is present on the hepatocytes, which in turn leads to the activation of apoptosis. Apart from that, CTA T cells also uh, uh, causes the increased secretion of granzymes, which in turn also leads to apoptosis. So what happens with the CD4 T cells? CD4 T cells can lead to the apoptosis either through the release of granzymes or through the FAS and FAS legend interaction, or they can also cause the release of TNF alpha, beta, and interferon, which in turn also enhances the apoptosis. So here the apoptosis which is happening is because of immune mediated. But apoptosis can also happen because of the direct cytopathic effect of the virus on the liver. This in turn can lead to the, as I told, there is a morphological changes in the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, which in turn leads to the activation of intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. And there can also be the activation of P53, which in turn leads to the further apoptosis enhancement. Now, these are the various studies which have shown that once the patient is infected with the dengue virus, 90% of the patients will have a deranged ASD, and the derangement in the ALT can ranges from 60 to 90%. ASD derangement is seen more than compared to ALT because ASD has been released from various other organs other than the liver, like a heart and the striated muscles. Hyperbilirubinemia ranges from 1 to 17%, and it has shown that only uh, approximately 10% of are the patients which have shown more than 10x times increase in the ASD or the ALT levels. If we talk about the children, the scenario is same, but however, the hepatomegaly is seen more often in children compared to that of adults. So this is the kinetic, this is a study where they have enrolled the cases infected with the severe dengue and the non-severe dengue cases. What they found is that the, the highest, the peak of AST level were found when the duration of the illness is five to six days. And the significant difference um, increase in the ALT level was seen in the cases with severe dengue compared to non-severe dengue, which was very apparent around five to six days. The same holds true for ALT. ALT levels generally peak around seven days of illness. However, no difference in the severe and non-severe dengue cases could be ascertained. They also tried to look. No significant difference in bilirubin and aspar uh, uh, alkaline phosphatase level was seen. And they also tried to correlate with the various uh, release of cytokines like interleukin 10 and 17. Now, these are the various studies which have tried to look upon the derangement of the, uh, yes, um, derangement of the liver function tense with the liver injury. What they concluded is the derange, uh, enhanced AST LT level or decrease in the albumin level correlates well with the severity of the dengue, but does not correlate it well with the mortality or the poor outcome. Recently, they have also tried to uh, measure the various apoptosis. As I told, apoptosis enhanced. They tried to measure out various caspases activity. And what they found is that, yes, a significant level of, uh, they have found it a certain cutoff, which helps in differentiating the patients uh, in the severe uh, dengue cases with or without dengue case, severe cases. So there are the certain studies where try to look upon the various models or the markers where we can predict severity of the mortality. However, till date, there is no such validated single model. What, so what is the effect of the in, uh, dengue in a cases with the underlying liver disease? Hardly I got three studies, and where they have shown that there is no effect of underlying chronic liver disease with the severity of the dengue. And the first uh, and the only study which I found from India is from our ILBS Institute study, where they have characterize the patients into three groups, the patients with no liver disease and patients with chronic liver disease and patients with chronic liver disease along with cirrhosis. What they found is the patients with CLD and the cirrhosis has less evident hemox concentration, prolonged INR thrombocytopenia, and prolonged hospital stay. So they concluded the INR and the bilirubin label can be used as a predictor for the ALF in such cases. Dengue itself can lead to various complications like acute liver failure. So these cases, they are from India, there are isolated case reports with a very few studies we have tried to look upon. Dengue can also lead to a, uh, other complications, that is HLH, and various small case reports are available from the literature. So now to conclude, these flaviviruses are the viruses which have a global threat 
and uh, the liver involvement can vary with the uh, yellow fever and the dengue with the uh, have documented hepatotropism. The uh, injury to the liver can be either direct effect or through the immune mediated. And infection of these flaviviruses can vary from mild elevation to transaminitis to the various complications like ALF. The, uh, these viruses must be excluded out depending upon the epidemiology of that particular country. For example, in our country, all such cases presenting with the deranged LFTs must be excluded dengue, especially during the uh, seasonal uh, variations. Presently, there is no uh, well-validated uh, scores which can predict the chances of poor outcome or the mortality among such patients. Very limited literature is available on the spectrum of dengue among the chronic liver disease patients, and they have concluded that the typical features of the dengue might be marked in such cases. So, such, uh, so a, a very high clinical suspicion must always be taken into consideration, especially during the dengue peak season, that is for the uh, post-monsoon uh, time. And the continuous molecular surveillance of the dengue is required because our country is hyperendemic, where all the four serotypes are there. There is so much genetic diversity, and there is always a chance of emergence of the new variants, which has the potential to cause a new outbreak. So, with this, thank you. Very nice ratio. I wish we had more time. Uh, but thank you for a very nice. Uh, I wish we had more data of ILBS also. There are yes. so many dengue liver failures. Yes, yeah, so, uh, this season we got two cases of uh, dengue associated uh, ALF. Both yeah. of these two cases were recovered. We don't yeah. spend any mortality in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm talking about common lapses in reporting methods and results of randomized control trials. So as you may be familiar, this is the consort reporting guidelines for clinical trials. Uh, the latest updated one was consort 2010. Um, this, this article specifically pertains to uh, the generic design. And then there are 30 modifications of this consort statement one for each alternative design. So there's one for cluster randomized trial, there's one for stepped wedge, there's one for crossover trial, equivalence, in non-inferiority, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what I'll be talking about today is this generic guidance for the parallel group design. Uh, what's quoted here is the first sentence from this document. Uh, the whole of medicine depends on the transparent reporting of clinical trials, uh, which is probably not an exaggeration. So what I'll be picking out uh, are the items that are most commonly reported um, in literature to be misreported. So for example, this is a Cochrane review that talked about uh, common lapses in reporting consort, uh, as per consort. And there are many other uh, articles out there in literature who've done sort of an audit uh, of uh, the reporting um, quality of randomized control trials. So what I'll be picking out is just the common items that are reported uh, in all of these articles. So of course, the design we are covering today is the prototypical parallel group randomized control trial. There are many, many modifications of this design. Uh, and of course, the, the extensions of the consort statement, the 30, 40 extensions that they have, they pertain to the alternatives uh, to this generic design. But we'll be talking about this design. Now, as you may be aware, the basic design of an RCT is very simple. So you have these two groups. Uh, and what's really beautiful in an RCT is the way that these two groups are created. So that's through a process called randomization. Uh, conceptually, randomization is very similar to flipping a coin. Uh, so that means that every participant who enters your trial should have an equal probability of landing up either into the intervention arm or the control arm. So conceptually, it is like a coin flip. And therefore, uh, the real beauty, and this is actually a very beautiful process, because what you land up with is two groups that are prognostically balanced. So these two groups of people, the intervention and control, they have the same destiny, right? So they have 
uh, equal balance of all prognostic factors, be it age, be it gender, be it comorbidities, you know, anything that may possibly influence the outcome uh, is equally balanced. So you have two prognostically balanced groups, and therefore, any difference in the outcome that you achieve or notice in the end of the trial can be attributed to the intervention. So the first two items that uh, are commonly uh, reported to be uh, misreported are pertaining to randomization itself. So the first uh, item um, pertains to random sequence generation. Uh, so very often trials do not report how the sequence was generated. What this is talking about is basically making an unpredictable list or assignment rule, right? Now, um, this is done by referring to a ran random number table, and now there are many, many softwares. Uh, so what you would like to see uh, is that the trial reported um, that the random sequence generation was done using a computer-generated random number table. So this is what you have to mention, computer random number generator. Uh, so this is what consort said, says, authors should specify the method of sequence generation, such as random number table or computerized random number generator. Now, however, this is often missed. So this is an example of poor sequence generation. This was a trial that said children, so this compared to drugs for uh, epilepsy in children, and they said children were assigned to receive either diazepam or lorazepam on an odd and even dates basis. That is, children admitted on an odd date received diazepam, and those on an even date received lorazepam. So this is not randomization. Uh, any, um, you know, such modifications, such as or using alternate patient IDs, using alternate um, uh, date of birth or years of birth, you know, that does not qualify as randomization. And therefore, consort says that, however, random is often inappropriately used in literature to describe non-random deterministic allocation methods, such as alternation, hospital numbers, or date of birth. And authors should refrain from using such non-random non methods. Now, the second item which pertains to randomization, uh, I'll describe in the form of one very famous trial that was later published and they conceded that this happened. Uh, this was a trial that happened in Australia where they were comparing open versus laparoscopic appendectomy. So these trialists, they created a beautiful sequence. So it was a computer-generated random number sequence. And they had that random sequence uh, that had either lap or open written on it, they were arranged in sequentially numbered envelopes. So, of course, the sequence was stuck together in, in sequentially numbered envelopes. So, as a patient would report to the emergency suspected appendicitis, they would tear out the next envelope, or possibly a resident or somebody in the emergency. They would tear out the next envelope, they would open it, and if it said open, the patient would go to open appendectomy, and if it said lap, the patient would go to lap. Now, what happened in this hospital was that the residents were only trained in conducting open appendectomy, okay, not laparoscopic. And, you know, this naturally created a very awkward situation during the night because, you know, they would have to call up their faculty late at night and tell them, okay, you know, the sequence says laparoscopic, so please come for laparoscopic in the emergency. And so what they started doing was this, you know, so they would tear out the envelope, they would hold it against the tube light, and they would keep doing it, you know, until they found one that said open appendectomy. So if, they, if it said lap, they would keep it little behind in the sequence. So, you know, they disturbed that sequence. Now, my question to you is, how would this affect the result of the trial? So which one would end up looking better? And why? Yeah, one is that faculty would be more trained, but usually when I ask this question to residents, they say residents <laughs> are better. But what else? What about the kind of patients? So who would who would who would be allocate? What kind of patients would be allocated to laparoscopic? What would be who would be allocated in terms of severity? Say. Right. So you would agree that patients who come during the night time are usually more sick. They are sicker. So all of the patients who got allocated to laparoscopic were less sick or more sick? Less sick, right. And all the ones who got open were more severe because they were the ones who came during night. 
Now, this is why even though you, once you've created the sequence, you have to hide it, right? And you have to mention how the sequence was hidden from the recruiter. So it's not that you make a beautiful sequence and then you stick it up. And this is, um, uh, you know, important because the recruiter then cannot influence uh, who gets allocated where. So the random sequence is hidden from the recruiter. Allocation concealment refers to not knowing to which arm the next patient will go to, right? So in unconcealed trials, recruiters may systematically, systematically enroll sicker or less sick patients to treatment or control. How is this achieved? And what consort says that this is often not reported. So only 18, only 18 percent of trials reported any allocation concealment mechanism, uh, and some of those reported mechanisms were inadequate. So how do you do it? Um, the most frequently uh, used method now is the interactive voice response system, the IVRS. So this is similar to your customer care where you have to call in and you have to dial numbers. I know a number of trials here are actually using the IVRS. Um, but basically, the sequence should be with a third party. So, you know, if you say something like uh, there was central allocation, so the sequence was with a third party not involved with the trial, or it was, it was remote randomization, web-based. Or you could use sealed, opaque, sequentially numbered envelopes, the key word here being opaque. That's SNOS, S-N-O-S-E. Uh, and you could use placebo. So in a placebo controlled trials, of course, nobody knows which is drug, which is placebo. So that takes care autom automatically. Um, so this is an example. Uh, this sequence was concealed from study researchers, and the allocation to treatment groups was obtained by telephone to an interactive voice response system, IVRS, developed by so-and-so. So this is how you report it. Now, concealment is different from blinding. Uh, I won't go through this entire table, but just to tell you that blinding uh, refers to making different players in the trial unaware of which is treatment and which is control, right? So basically, allocation concealment is protecting the sequence before the randomization and after those groups are created through randomization, after that, the sequence is maintained through blinding, right? To clarify further, let me give you an example. Um, so this is just consort saying that allocation concealment should not be confused with blinding. You should explicitly, separately mention allocation concealment. But to tell you the influence of blinding, let me give you an example. This was a review that we had done that compared um, six months versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy after stenting. So some uh, the trials compared six months versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet, so aspirin alone versus aspirin plus clopidogrel. Now, all of these trials were unblinded trials. So everybody knew, the physician knew, the patient knew that they are in the single antiplatelet or in the dual antiplatelet arm after six months. So what happened in these trials was that the physician, they knew, okay, this is a patient that, that's in the single antiplatelet arm. So they increased the dose of aspirin, right? Whereas very often what happened was that the patient knew I'm in the single antiplatelet arm, so he went out and bought the other drug, right? So these are two terms that are very often referred to when we're talking about blinding. One is co-intervention and the other is contamination, right? So the patient... Um, going out and buying the other drug, that is contamination. So he was supposed to be in the single antiplatelet, but got dual antiplatelet. The physician increasing the dose of aspirin in order to compensate, that is co-intervention, right? So this is how blinding protects the sequence, in the sense that you started out with two groups that are prognostically balanced, but that is no guarantee that they will stay prognostically balanced throughout the trial. And that is what blinding uh, helps with. It avoids co-intervention, it avoids contamination. Now, who is blinded? There are five types of people who can be blinded in a trial. Patients, caregivers, data collectors, outcome adjudicators, and data analysts. Outcome adjudicators are independent assessors who certify that the outcome has occurred. They are assessors apart from those involved in the trial. And this is a very famous uh, survey that happened. P.J. Devaru had done this survey where he had asked 91 physicians to provide their definition of double blind. So who is blinded in a double blinded trial? And they also did a review of textbooks. So what do textbooks say with regard to who is blinded in a double blinded trial? 
So what would you say? Who out of these two, these five people are blinded in a double-blinded trial? Yeah, so if I were asked, I would also say patients and caregivers. But the results revealed that there's actually no consensus whatsoever. So nobody knows. Uh, there are 38% of people who said what we said, but then 13% uh, said all four of these groups, 10% said all five, and 29% said other things, right? So this is why consort says do not use the term double blind. They say that these terms are ambiguous, and as such, authors and editors should abandon their use, right? So just tell us explicitly who all were blinded. Now coming on to results, and this is where things get really interesting. Uh, this is often the first uh, table in the uh, RCT, the reporting of RCT. The first table is the baseline characteristics table. And very often, uh, this is associated with a third column here. So this is comparing the baseline characteristics which you want to be balanced across groups. Now, the third column here that trialists add is the significance testing for baseline differences. Now, this may be perceived as kind of like nitpicking or hair splitting on behalf of consort, but this is what consort says on significant significance tests for baseline difference. So p-value that you put on the third column, they say uh, you should not do it, right? They say, unfortunately, significance tests for baseline differences are still common. Such hypothesis testing is superfluous and can mislead investigators and their readers. Now, why is this? Well, because what the p-value is telling you in the baseline characteristics table is that whether any differences that are occurring in the baseline are they by chance or not, right? But in a randomized control trial, any difference that will occur has to be by chance, right? So at a threshold of 0.05, 1 in 20 p-values will always be less than 0.05. That is expected, right? Which is why they say that do not do the significance testing for baseline differences. This is just an article that said it's an unhealthy research behavior that ha that's hard to eradicate. However, the next point is, I think, way more important and deserves way more uh, attention. So let me tell you about these two trials. Um, they are comparing interventions versus placebo. And so what is depicted here is the result from these two trials. So you can see here that study B, of course, would be way bigger. This line, let me tell you what this is depicting first. This line in the middle is the line of no effect. So this is a risk difference of zero. Uh, so risk difference is basically difference in incidence of the outcome between the two groups, right? So if there's 60% mortality in placebo arm and 40% mortality in intervention arm, 20% is the risk difference, right? So that is what is depicted here. This line in the middle is the line of no effect. Uh, this line here in the center is the point estimate. So this is the best guess from the results of the trial. And this horizontal line is the confidence interval. So the confidence interval is a concept that's similar to margin of error, which is the whole range of values that is consistent with the data, the whole range of plausible values. So you can see here that these are the results of those two, of those two trials. And you can see here that of course, study B would naturally be a bigger trial because you just look at the confidence intervals. Uh, it's very narrow. Whereas study A is, you know, it's probably smaller. Now, both of these studies are showing an effect. You agree that both of these studies are showing an effect. It's, they're both positive trials. However, the result of this study, study A is clarifying that the range of possible values can extend up to even a 20% benefit. So, it could range from a possibly small benefit, 1% benefit, to 19% of risk difference. Whereas it has been clarified through study B that this study only has a small benefit, okay? So 95% CI clarifies that drug A has a moderate effect and may have a big effect. Whereas drug B has only a small effect, right? So the p-value of both of these studies is the same. It is 0 0.03, statistically significant. So a p-value will tell you this much, that you know it's a positive trial, that the result is statistically significant. It's on one side of the line of no effect. But it's not giving you any idea of what magnitude you can expect. So it's telling you that it's on this side of the line of no effect, but how far does it go? You know, it's going till 20%. It's possible that the intervention may even have a 20% reduction. 
uh, in the outcome. So that is being depicted only by the confidence interval. So which is why p-value does not give you any indication of the magnitude of the effect. Now to take a converse example, these are two studies that had, these were two negative trials, right? So both of them showed no benefit. Um, now over here in study B, the uh, effect can range from minus 0.1 to plus 0.1, right? And in study A, the effect can range from minus 48% to plus 48%. Right? Now both of them are negative trials, but which one tells you with more certainty that the drug does not have an effect? Study B, right? Study B tells you with more certainty, whereas study A you can say is inconclusive. You know, this is an inconclusive result. So this you can say is evidence of absence of an effect. You have enough evidence that the, there is no effect of the drug. Whereas study A is telling you that there's absence of evidence. You know, we don't know. It's inconclusive. But a p-value of both of these studies is the same, 0.7, right? So again, a p-value does not distinguish between these two situations, uh, whether there's absence of evidence of an effect or evidence of absence of an effect. So that's inconclusive result or absolute negative result, right? And very often negative trials fail to exclude an important difference. So very often you'll find a result like this, you know, very wide confidence interval, and you'll say it's a negative trial, whereas the result may be consistent with even a 40% reduction in the outcome, right? Which is why it's very important that the effect size and the confidence intervals both be reported in the result of the trial. So this is what consort says, p-values may be provided in addition to confidence intervals, but results should not be reported solely as p-values. So this is an example that I've taken out, or this is how it used to be done. This is the old uh, trend, old uh, system of reporting, where you give the proportions and the p-value, where you give the you know mean scores and the p-value. Whereas now, this is extracted from a trial uh, from the Lancet, uh, where they, uh, whatever the intervention was, and uh, this is how they've reported it. The, the effect size, so this is a dichotomous outcome improvement, the effect size is the relative risk and the confidence interval, and then the p-value. And for continuous outcome, you give mean difference, right, mean difference, and the confidence interval, and then the p-value, okay? Uh, so this is an example of often a journal that took an extreme step of banning the p-value, but this is, may or may not be apt or appropriate, but the general evolving narrative in epidemiology is that now, uh, we are moving away from p-value towards estimation. So uh, the magnitude of the effect is what, you know, tells us whether it's clinically important or not, the difference. And therefore, the confidence interval has to be reported. Now, this example, I think, and of course, uh, in the, in, uh, as I had discussed before, in the context of a non-inferiority trial, the whole conclusion of non-inferiority depends on the confidence interval, right? So if you remember our discussion back then, uh, the way that you conclude non-inferiority is by looking at where the confidence interval is lying with respect to the non-inferiority margin. Now, the last thing, uh, last um, item possibly there's time for is this one. And this is an example that I had cited before uh, when I talked about non-inferiority trials, but it's pertinent to mention here as well. So this was a trial that was reported in the NEJM way back, 1980, where they compared uh, a statin, a new statin versus placebo. So uh, 2,000 each were randomized to receiving the statin or receiving placebo. Now out of those that were randomized to the new statin, there were compliers and non-compliers, right? So 800 complied and 1,200 did not comply. Out of those who complied, 15 there was 15% mortality in compliers and in placebo arm there was 21% mortality. So this was an industry-sponsored trial, and so industry said, look, if you take the drug, there's 15% mortality, and in the placebo arm, there's 20% mortality, and this difference is very, very, very statistically significant, and so the drug works, right? Now, is there anything else you want to know about the results of this trial before you advise this new statin? Right, so I think Dr. Raki was asking, what is the mortality in non-compliers? It was 25%. Anything else? Okay. 
Okay, yeah. So, so it is saying that you have to compare total, but why, why, why is that? I mean, it's the correct answer, but why should we? I mean, of course, we only expect a difference in, in those who have taken the drug, right? We don't expect non-compliers to have the effect of the drug. So that is what the company said. If you take the drug, it works. Ah, right. So he's asking what, in the placebo arm, what about compliers and non-compliers? That's an excellent question. Because if you look at the mortality in the compliers and non-compliers in the placebo arm, you'll see that, again, there's a statistically significant difference, right? So 15% mortality in compliers in placebo arm, 25% mortality in non-compliers in the placebo arm. Then look at this p-value, it's less than 0 0.0001. And overall, of course, there's no difference. So 21% and 20% mortality in both the groups. But what this example tells you is that compliance itself is kind of like a prognostic factor, right? So those who comply with the intervention to which they are allocated, they're also the ones who comply with other, uh, you know, lifestyle uh, interventions like healthy eating and exercise. And they're they also the ones who comply with antihypertensives, for example. Which is why in an, in an analysis of an RCT, you cannot just take compliers into your analysis, even though that's tempting because you want to say, you know, it's only if, if the patient complies with the intervention do I expect an effect. But the main reason to include all into your analysis is that the prognostic balance that you have, the prognostic balance that randomization created at baseline, it is for these two groups, 2000 and 2000. Right? If you do compliers only analysis, that's called a per protocol analysis, what you've taken out of your analysis is a group of people who are very different prognostically than those that you've included. So this is why the consort statement says that uh, information about whether investigators included in their analyses, all participants who underwent randomization in the groups to which they were originally allocated, and that's the intention to treat analysis, right? Uh, of course, in the context of a non-inferiority trial, which I had spoken, spoken about earlier, the situation is different. So there, um, an intention to treat analysis and a poor protocol both have to be done. But then that is a diverse design with unique interpretational challenges, and that's for another day. Uh, there are other reasons to do intention to treat. It's a more conservative estimate. It's more difficult to show an effect with ITT and many others. But the main reason is this that we want to preserve the prognostic balance that randomization created in the first place. Uh, so this is just the concert statement on ITT, uh, but I've already spoken about the concept. And I think this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, just take one minute. This was a trial that compared five versus four courses of chemotherapy and AML. And you see here that uh, these trialists, so this is five courses and this is four courses, and the outcome is um, mortality. So of course, in the beginning, when there are very few events, you'll see that the confidence interval is very wide. Okay, and so, but as more, you know, they started recruiting more patients and they noticed that, okay, you know, there appears to be a benefit with five courses as compared to four courses. And so here they had actually met their stopping boundary. So this is where they found a statistically significant result but the trialist said, you know what, this is probably too good to be true, so we're going to continue to enroll. And as they enrolled more and more patients and as more and more events accrued, you will notice here that this benefit that they had noticed in the beginning, it was actually lost. And there was an indication towards increased mortality with five courses of chemotherapy. Now, had they stopped here, right here, they would have subjected patients to unnecessary, you know, extra course of chemotherapy with no benefit and possibly even some harm. Now, this often happens in our cities that with few events, very few events and small sample sizes, you'll notice a very big benefit, right? A very large magnitude of uh, benefit. But then as more and more events accrue, that benefit will be lost, okay? This is called regression to the truth. Pocock described it, described it as regression to the truth. So this is just a depiction that uh, if this, these are a number of trials that are studying a small, a small true beneficial effect. Some will start out and they'll remain at this true beneficial effect. Some will in the beginning show harm, but as more and more events accrue, they will again regress to the truth. So they'll arrive at the small benefit. 
Some will show benefit, a large benefit. So this is one of the trials that were in this category. They'll show very large benefit, and then as more and more events accrue, they will. Now, if you uh, stop, keep doing interim analysis in between, it's possible that you will conclude benefit early on with a few number of events. But then had you continue, continue to enroll, that benefit would have uh, regressed to the true small benefit. Which is why uh, interim analyses has specific rules in consort uh, that you have to report the timing of all interim analyses, what triggered them, how many took place, whether these were planned or ad hoc, and whether statistical guidelines and stopping rules were in place a priori. So there are a number of statistical techniques that have been developed to avoid concluding a false positive result from an interim analysis. And this is often not reported in published trials. So the last section, I think I'll stop here. This was related to uh, relative and absolute effects, and I'll conclude. Maybe I'll save that for another day. Uh, that with regard to methods, random sequence generation must be explicitly mentioned. Allocation concealment and blinding must be mentioned explicitly how it was achieved. Confidence intervals have a special place in reporting of randomized control trials. And whenever you report the result of a trial, you have to report the effect size and the associated CI. and of and also the p-value, but not just the p-value. Uh, the analysis for a superiority trial has to be done on the intention to treat principle, not per protocol. And stopping early for benefit, trials that have stopped early for benefit or, or shown an effect in an interim analysis, they have to be, uh, they have to be stringent me measures in place to avoid making a false positive conclusion. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Manya. Uh, it's nice we have limitations of time. But just to announce, Dr. Amar, Professor Amar received the most prestigious award of the International uh, Radiology, the J.C. Bose Award. A big round of applause.